Hey, welcome to uh, Stephen Platinum versus Raw. This is the show from 5-25-2020. That was yesterday. <clears throat> so, it's Memorial Day. And this is something that I would suggest AEW gets on. Uh, because... WWE, and forgive me if I get a little too deep with this stuff, but I believe that they control the narrative. They are pro wrestling. I don't think there's anybody denying that. I don't think that there's anybody in their right mind who says that the WWE isn't pro wrestling to the average person in the United States. Um, with that said, I've suggested that AEW in the past take control of narratives more and start making themselves the fabric of people's lives, just like cotton. Um, it's important to do, and the WWE shows why here. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not being jaded and saying that that is their intent and they don't really care about Memorial Day. Of course they do, um, and they make it a point to. Um, they put up this, these things about Memorial Day and they're narrated and they're gorgeous and they're wonderful and they're beautiful. And they devote um, a great deal of time to it and it's important. Now you can be cynical and say Raw's three hours. They have uh, a lot that they could devote themselves to. Um, and you wouldn't be wrong necessarily, but I still think it was it's a very nice thing. It sort of cements the WWE in the eyes of the people watching that they're still the thing in pro wrestling, though I think AEW has been doing a number of things to start establishing themselves as well. A lot of their promos kind of center on this whole virus thing that everybody's going through and how they're a part of that and uh, how they're a part of uh, helping to recover and, and that kind of thing. And, and again, when you're big time, uh, I think these are the things that you do. I think the NFL does it. The NBA does it. Most major entertainment venues do it. Pro wrestling should follow suit. Um, great job, WWE. I also thought this show overall is one of the strongest they've done in recent memory, certainly since I've been following Raw um, and watching the entire show. They set up a bunch of things in the beginning. We're going to get a U.S. champion match, Andrade versus Apollo Crews, and that's something that they've been developing over the weeks. So that's good. Um, we're in the VIP lounge, and again, uh, I'm a big fan of MVP. It's something that's happened relatively recently, but I get to, I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm biased towards him. I think he does a great job. I think hooking him up with Lashley is a phenomenal move. Um, I just like all the moves that he makes. Even when they write something that's a little wonky for him, he pulls it through, which is a sign of greatness. I'm a fan of MVP. So that's what we can look forward to tonight. So we're going to get Andrade against Apollo Crews. The other things that they set up is one of the major matches. It's going to be Charlotte. I, get, I guess this whole thing about you can only go to other brands four times. That's out the freaking window, apparently. But whatever. Um, we know how that goes. It's Charlotte versus Natalia. Natalia, which I think is a really weird choice. They just showed Natalia tapping out last week. Um, and so it's Natalia against like Shayna instead of like Shayna Baszler or something. Doesn't make any sense, but it's WWE in the modern era. It is what it is. Charlotte versus Natalia versus Nia Jax um, to compete. And then the, whoever wins this will go on to take on Asuka for the Raw Women's title at the next pay-per-view, which we are told is Backlash. Um, so you can kind of pencil this one in and under... Um, foregone conclusion a little bit. I, was, I, I circled right away. Nia Jax is obviously going to win because she's the only one who's got something uh, really going on with Asuka because of all the shenanigans from last week. Uh, we're going to have the KO show and, uh, and he's going to take on Angel Garza later. But for now, his guest is first Asuka's the guest. And she's yelling and screaming and doing her shtick um, to various levels of amusement. And then Charlotte comes out. <laughs> this whole exchange with Charlotte, Asuka, Kevin Owens, it feels very disjointed and awkward. Segments of this show felt really, really strange and not quite connecting. Um, it's almost as if they don't know how to handle having something resembling a crowd again. Because, yes, we have... 33 people from the Performance Center behind Plexiglass, which I actually thought was kind of a cool look. And there's a lot that they can do with that. And um, 
And Charlotte, as soon as she gets out the line, you need to manage your expectations, which was uh, an offshoot. Whoever wrote that line for her um, probably got it from YouTube drama of this big YouTuber who used to be a big Viner called Gabby Hanna. Now you're going like, Steve, why are you bringing this up? Because it's good to have knowledge of this stuff, right? That manage your expectations line was from Gabby Hanna when she was promoting this um, makeup brush line that was supposed to be free except for the shipping. And then the shipping ended up being $10, which is already like, huh? And then people either didn't get their brushes or they got them late and then they were of dubious quality. And Gabby Hanna, instead of just flat out apologizing and saying the truth, which was, oh, I took this money and I shouldn't have, um, or I should have checked into these people who were giving me money. She said, well, you know, it's, it's $10 shipping for 10 brushes. So that's like a dollar a brush. So people who thought that you're going to get this high quality thing should really manage their expectations. Uh, she was dragged by other YouTubers big time for that. And uh, I thought it was cool that Charlotte hit the line, but again, they swallowed the lineup by the music hitting. And then Natalia and then Nia Jax and then Kevin Owens who the one thing I do not like that he does is he does too much commentary, meaning he comments on what's going on. It's like when you have a bunch of comics on stage doing improv and somebody's commenting, basically ruining the, the thing that you're creating, the atmosphere that you're creating by pretending you're the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm smarter than everybody else on the stage and I have a connection with the audience so I can tell them what's going on by breaking the fourth wall thing. Kevin Owens does that way too much and he does it here by going, well, I know where this is going. And then he steps out of the ring and then the women start fighting. And again, it just removes their power. And I, I don't like it. I think commenting in this way in general is it's just a weak move and it's a very weak performance move. All right. So then we get a pro, uh, promo with Apollo Crews. Short, sweet to the point, but he seems very earnest. I like that they're going Total babyface, earnest, I'm going to do my best to win this title. And then uh, U.S. champion Andrade with uh, Zariah is at ringside. And uh, we go to commercial. This was a thing that Raw did constantly, is they would just cut to commercial. Um, they would cut to commercial after one person would get to the ring. That's their way of trying to bridge through the commercial break and get you to the other side. It's a tactic. We'll see if it works. Um, during this commercial break, the most notable thing is they're pushing this notion of Edge versus Randy Orton, the greatest wrestling match ever, as a stated bona fide fact. Um, I'm sure I'm going to talk about that later on, but that's the first major segment up to the commercial. Now we are back. Um, we go over, somebody brings up one of the commentators and Samoa Joe, by the way, was dynamite all night long. The other two commentators were fought perfectly good, but Samoa Joe really was on point with what he was saying. Um, there's 45 years or celebrating 45 years of United States title. And they brought up champs, just Harley Race. Uh, Samoa Joe was part of that group as well. And then John Cena had that fantastic run at one point. Um, so now you got Apollo Cruz versus Andrade for the U.S. title with Zelina. You notice I normally won't go into mo much nuts and bolts about the match itself. I'll just give sort of general notes. Um, Zelina was knocked off the apron. This was a very interesting spot to me. One, because of the crazy heels she had on. I can't believe she was expected to land on her feet in those freaking heels and she didn't break an ankle. Um, but then they sold it as if she was really hurt and what was the decision going to be. Andrade, um, sadly, at the end of his reign, has gotten a great deal of personality. He kept, you know, saying how he was going to hold on to this title. He was very adamant about it. He was very emotional when it came to Zelina getting knocked down and hit. Um, she was selling. She decided she wanted to stay in the match. And then we went to commercial again. So now technically we've gone through two commercial breaks for this match. Uh, and they, But they did the split screen at one point so we could see her being tended to and that kind of thing. Uh, Andrade was wrestling very savagely, uh, which I thought was a good look for this match. And it really contrasted with the very baby face way that Apollo Crews was wrestling. Not that Apollo Crews was opposed to some rough stuff, but that had been established that that was more than justified over the treatment that he had gotten over the last two shows. Um, the slow to fast replay 
is uh, very effective. When did they use it? During this really awkward spot where um, Cruz went to the kind of mounted the ropes to do a move to Andrade and then Andrade hit him. So he kind of fell backwards, but held on to the top rope. So he could basically just this big setup. So he could do a double stop from the top rope to uh, his chest um, at like the second rope level. Um, it didn't look perfect, but then the slow to fast replay made it look perfect. Uh, I like the idea where they interviewed Angel Garza during the match while still show as if he was watching the match so you can still see it on the television when it was during a part that there wasn't much action going on. It was mostly Andrade yelling at the camera. And so they cut to Angel Garza. A great idea, but it wasn't good. It was awkward. Like, there were a lot of weird, awkward moments during this Raw. I still think, overall, it's one of the better shows they've done lately. But, uh, and, and I'm not mad at them trying stuff. I'm not mad at them stealing AWEs. Let's have other wrestlers in the crowd idea. It's long overdue, honestly. Um, Samoa Joe gave great justifications Um for the end of this match. And one of the cool things he said, just little comments that he made, but he said this great thing of Andrade had perhaps, you know, he had basically blown his wad. He had fired up and he was very angry and active at one point, but now he was slowing down. And this coincided with Cruz taking over hitting a standing moonsault, hitting a standing shooting star, and then winning. And the the reaction from him felt very heartfelt. From the audience, such as it was, reacting to him winning felt very great. Um, he gave a really wonderful post-fight, post-winning the title promo. Just a, He's a pure baby face. And I think this is how you have to go with him is somebody who they've tried to unsuccessfully to get over for years. And now this is his moment. And I think you go pure. And I think he's the right guy to do that with. And I was really glad to see it. I think this is a home run opening segment. Um, I, I mean, I found the, the interaction with the women on the KO show thing really wonky. But this absolutely worked. Um, and I was really glad to see it. And then you had um, Seth Rollins doing a little promo with Rey Mysterio's mask. Apparently, that's something we're going to have to put up with a lot. And then uh, we're going to have the Street Prophet, Prophets and the Viking Raiders playing golf, which I could not be less excited about if it was anything like the debacle and the crap that they put on last week. But we'll see if they can do better. At least you can say, I guess that they're not giving up on it. Yeah. All right, so that now we roll into another commercial break and another segment. So here we are. Um, by the way, um, this might be a little too much inside baseball, but as as this part of the show was going on, I have notes here about the shows that they put on in Tennessee that Burt Prentice put on that had 150 people at it. We were discussing how that this is possibly okay. Um, and so I thought that that was interesting that we're, you know, there's other wrestling shows trying to run that probably shouldn't run, but apparently have enough pull that they can run. It just seemed very, very shady that there was a wrestling show with 150 people in Tennessee going on. Hmm. And if you don't know Burt Prentice, there's stories. Back to the show. Um, we got a Seth promo. He's talking to Murphy and Austin Theory. Um, they look good together. And Seth is basically saying they're going to have a match tonight with uh, the guys who were sort of the thorn in their side last week. Humberto, who's fighting for the honor of Rey Mysterio. And Aleister Black. Yeah. And then there's a Charlotte promo. And her promos um, are always solid, but incredibly much the same in tone and what she says. And this one's no exception. Asuka comes on, and I'm afraid we're going to have another incredibly awkward moment where things just don't seem like they're working. But then Asuka hits this great line in perfect English. Ah, red's not your color. And even Charlotte doesn't quite to see know how to react to that really killer line by Asuka. Very interesting. And then we get the Iconics to the ring, and we go to a commercial. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stick with it for this segment, though. So now we come back to the Iconics, who, again, I absolutely hated their, their, their stupidity, um, which led to... Uh, them losing the title match and then one of them slapping the other and then apologizing for it. I just hated that whole 
whole bit. So we're here in the midst of the Iconics promo. Uh, they come to the ring. Uh, one thing we, they need to get on board, which AEW has done better and better each week, is what are the people in the crowd? They got to stop fighting themselves. Sometimes they cheer the Iconics. Sometimes they boo them. They need to get on the same page with reactions. If they're, you're only going to have 30 people or less reacting to a thing, they need to be on the same page. You can't have muddled, muddy reactions. Cue the audience on what they're supposed to think. Never assume that people who watch your show are people who watch your show every week. Yeah. Um, then the uh, and then of course you got the uh, the babyface tag team comes off. Nikki cuts a really good promo. I think they did a good job of addressing the elephant of the room, which is Nikki is seen as sort of the weak sister. Um, and so what they do is they point out the fact you're not allowed to talk, which gives her a bigger voice and they really let her carry the promo. I thought Alexa Bliss was really great in doing this and it instantly made Nikki seem more important and an equal on the team instead of the lesser than. Really, really, really smart. Um, the Iconics beat them up. Uh, and then we get a segment where... MVP is with Lana. I said last week that all that <laughs> nonsense with Lana screaming and all that worked in spite of the fact that it was so kind of badly set up and done, but they, their performances somehow carried it through. That's the case here. Um, MVP with Lana where she's like, we, we got to talk. And he goes, no, we don't. Somehow that manages to work in spite of itself. Um, now we're going to flow into a commercial. Um, we get a little tribute to uh, Shad Gaspard. Nothing long, but, you know, it's nice to put his picture up there and that kind of thing. Then we go to MVP in the VIP lounge. Uh, we got MVP with Drew. It's very awkward thing where they're talking about is it a Claymore kick or not. But they're, they're improving off of each other, which is nice. But it's still a very awkward, stilted exchange. Um, and then, you know... Lashley comes, um, MVP eats a Claymore, Lashley, instead of getting in the ring and fighting, um, pulls MVP out of there, which at first I thought, oh, that's kind of a weak move, but then I realized, like, oh, no, I bet you MVP and Lashley are going to have a match later on, and they're going to let Lashley look like a million bucks right before the close, and I was right on with that prediction, so good booking there. Um, then we have a promo from Natalia which is really awkward and this thing where her husband calls and that's supposed to be part of the reason that she's been acting so weird and it's odd. Um, we're, you know, we go to the ring, KO's walking to the ring, Garza jumps in, we go to commercial. Again, this sort of pattern of we're going to go to the commercials um, in between the two entrances so that way we have a kind of a hook and drag to get us through the commercial in theory during this commercial i thought that it was interesting that the faces that they're pushing for raw are the street profits oscar and drew mcintyre i think this is smart they gotta have to bite the bullet and just bring upon bring on this new generation of stars so now they're just making them the leads of it and that's the way they're gonna go and i think it's the way that you gotta go they're gonna suffer short-term consequences in this because they're not able to smoothly transition where people are passing the torch and that kind of thing in front of a large audience. But it is what it is. They've got to bite the bullet and they, they're having to, this was a raw where they bit the bullet a whole bunch of times. And I think it's ultimately going to work out for the greater good. So the next segment, um, KO's knee is hurt. Kevin Owens' knee is hurt. Really great sell. Um, he used this leg to do a number of great turnaround spots um, so the heel could keep giving him the heat. Really great. KO, I know, is not everybody's cup of tea, but he does the wrestling part incredibly well to me. And a really underrated seller. I think he really looks great. And uh, Garza goes over, hitting a really impressive-looking finisher off of Kevin Owens, again, having this hurt leg, which has got to categorize as a big win. In fact, I don't, I don't think the uh, commentators put this over enough. KO won one of the feature matches at WrestleMania against Seth Rollins, for goodness sakes, and here he is losing to Garza. Um, I thought that they should have made a bigger deal about it, frankly. Um, then we got an um, Undertaker commercial. 
And uh, I think that's really cool. Of course, that's really work working. Uh, then we go to this segment, Lord, 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 between the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders. They get kicked off of a golf course for being stupid. The segment is incredibly lame, incredibly weak, makes them both look stupid. Miniature golf happens. Again, they all look stupid again. Street Profits win, so they're up 2-1 in this. Anything you can do, I can do better, except for apparently put over a vignette in a segment, which neither of them do well. Um, then we go to Lana, MVP, and Lashley. Again, another awkward exchange that ends with Lana screaming her head off, which is, I guess, supposed to sell her emotion. It's, it's weird. Um, Seth fires up his guys. Then we go um, to commercial, and we are at the half hour mark. Um, we go flow right into Austin Theory and Murphy against Humberto and Alistair Black. I'll say this, Humber um, Humberto and Alistair Black had great chemistry as a tag team. If this happened back in the day, they would, they would marry those guys in a tag team. That's how good their chemistry was right in the beginning. I'm not just talking about hitting their spots. There's just something about them that worked together, and it's a testament to those two guys. Really good. Uh, Austin Theory and Murphy got the hell beat out of them throughout the whole match, and then Austin Theory catches Humberto in his finisher. Wow. And they get the win. Right team won. Right team looked great which is the face team. And then they do this bit where they're threatening to, to, to gouge out Humberto's eye. And so basically Seth Rollins forces Alistair Black to do all this stuff. Stop, put the chair down, blah, 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 blah. And uh, cuts a little promo and then disappears. I thought it was a great establishment that Seth Rollins manipulates everybody to get what he wants. And he can make anybody do anything. Um, if they keep that going, I think it's a really great heel thing. Um, again, Edge and Randy Orton pushing this greatest match ever. I'm just going to go ahead and commentate about this now because it also goes into a very good Edge promo and the greatest match ever and all the rest of it, which takes us into yet another commercial break. So let me just say my piece about the greatest match ever and the idea of this. Of course, people hate it and they go like, it's not even possible that it's going to happen and blah, 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 blah. Here's what I don't like about it. I think it's taking something it's forcing organic moments. And the problem with, of course, all organic moments in professional wrestling to some, in some way, shape or form are inorganic, meaning there is somebody who's making something happen. But when you put it and lay it right out there, it's not going to have the effect you want. You're not going to make more money by saying that it's going, that it's the greatest match ever you're not going to be able to live up to expectations. But to me, that's the most minor part of it. I mean, wrestling is about creating hype and then attempting to live up to the hype. That's what the main event is all about. That's what the money match is all about. But in this case, they're really doing these guys a disservice in that now they're going to have to, now they're enlisting Ric Flair and his new contract to sit there and, and, declare that these guys are going to have the it's the greatest match ever which feels so disingenuous that's the problem is they're tipping their hand to most of the people who watch their product and keep in mind they're down to a, just hardcores that are going to find this at the very least untrue and at the very very worst disrespectful to whoever their favorites of the past were and of their own history Again, forcing something that's supposed to be organic. It's like when you pipe in Goldberg chants, right? Does it work? In some way it does, but it, again, it removes the long-term impact of such a thing. And it removes a level of trust from your audience. Now, it might be small, but those small bits of losing trust add up to the point where you're wrestling in front of an audience of 1.6 million instead of 10 million. And when they show the rock and sock segments i remember some of those rock and sock this is your life rocky my via and stuff they drew over 10 10 ratings think about that 
and and having all of this stuff sort of swirl around each other on this raw was mind boggling but yeah gr- calling something the greatest match ever when it hasn't happened yet and it has very little chance of actually taking place as the greatest match ever it's just doing everybody a disservice and it's not even making money in the short term for saying it so in this next segment um, oh boy. So, um, bowling is apparently what's going to take place between the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders next week. So, we have that to look forward to. Yay. Uh, MVP cuts a good promo with a, little, a lot of possibilities, saying basically the Street Profits are being wasted, um, which definitely has that kernel of truth. And. A tag, long and short of it is a tag match is made between Bobby Lashley and MVP against the Street Profits, which will be our de facto main event tonight. Interesting. And now uh, we got the match between Charlotte, Natalia, and Nia Jax. Anytime the three of them had to do something together, um, like when they both power bombed when Natalia and Charlotte worked to power bomb Nia Jax through the table. It was incredibly awkward. Um, when they try to do that sort of mini Tower of Doom spot, that was incredibly awkwardly done. It just and nothing looked very crisp. Um, I, I was reminded, however, how interesting it is that Asuka is the Raw Women's Champion. And, and then you'll have... Um, and then you also have a Japanese woman as the champion of AEW. I don't think that that's ever existed before, uh, where you've had Japanese women sort of dominating the American landscape. It's very, very interesting and um, very good, too, I think. And, boy, Asuka is super expressive um, throughout the whole thing with the commentary. The match is a little clunky and a little awkward. Um, not to mention there's things that make absolutely no sense. Why would why would Charlotte um, be put in a or why would Charlotte put Natalia in a submission in a figure four while Nia Jax is in the ring? Like there's just so many spots that just don't make any kind of logical sense. So yeah, Nia hits her, gets her out of the ring, and then hits a Samoan drop and pins Natalia. And so Nia Jax in this foregone conclusion match is the winner and will go on to face Asuka. Just very strange. And now I see that Charlotte is going to be wrestling Asuka next week, which sort of belied the point. I don't I don't know. (laughs) It's just it's all so awkwardly done. The match was awkward. The setup was awkward. The having a submission take place when they're opponent is also in the ring that's going to break it up invariably while you're in a vulnerable position it's just all really strange here's where they actually show the rock and sock stuff which again is just another reminder that man they used to get 10 plus ratings for stuff um our truth cuts a promo because apparently he's been informed that tom brady is not the 24 7 champion that's gronkowski so the two of them exchange promos gronk actually does not cut a horrible promo um, but the overall vibe of it is pretty awful. Um, but our truth is, is again, such a consummate performer and so funny that he manages to carry this thing off. Um, MVP promo with Lashley. And, uh, and we go to commercial. When we come back, there's a Ric Flair promo talking about, Oh my gosh, that Edge and Orton are the greatest match ever, um, which is weird and I guess what things we do for money. Um, Undertaker Shawn Michaels stuff is shown, which is pretty sensational. The Undertaker series, of course, if you're not watching it, you should be watching it. And uh, Liv Morgan cuts another promo. I'm glad they're continuing to have her do these, but it is really, really, really odd. Um... They're, they're, her constant blinking um, sort of belies the truth and what she should be potentially telling. It just doesn't come across as authentic. 
And then finally, uh, we have the Street Profits match. The long and short of it is Bobby Lashley looks really dominant, um, which is what needed to happen here. And the Street Profits, who haven't been doing themselves favors with the vignettes, um, I guess they can suffer the loss here. But um, it, you would have a hard time telling me that being the tag team champions in the WWE matter whatsoever. And that's the end of Raw. Like I said, what, what I found to be actually a pretty good Raw. And uh, I'm Stephen Platinum.